Okay, hello everybody, uh, and welcome to Archeo Viking. Today we have um, a uh, very special guest here who has agreed to come on and talk about his work as well as uh, to provide um, his own experience as an archeologist and an indigenous man um, within that context. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, Jason Nez, and why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Jason Nez. I'm an archaeologist here. I work here at Grand Canyon National Park. I'm the fire archaeologist for the park, and I'm also a member of the Dene Nation. Oh. My roles here in the park I'm an archaeologist, resource advisor, firefighter. I fill a bunch of different roles. I talk about a lot of um, native issues here within the park on behalf of the park too sometimes wow oh, cool cool uh and and uh so so first let's start off with um how, how did you get your career in archaeology started like what sparked your interest in things like that so 20 years ago i was in college at northern arizona university in flagstaff and i got a job at navajo national monument which is a park service unit inside the Navajo reservation. And it was, seemed like it was gonna be a summer job. And I took it, I was down at the cliff dwellings at Kitsi and uh, I was down there. And in that time, I sort of learned about my relationship with the Pueblos down there and all the different prehistoric historic sites down there and realized my cultural connections. And I realized that our Navajo Dine respect for these sites has always been interpreted as fear, as, as as taboo. And in some cases, those are correct beliefs, but in others, it's just been wildly misinterpreted and used against us to disassociate us with our Pueblo ancestors. Okay. Um now I, I now I understand that um taboo often means that you can't always necessarily talk about it so feel free to abstain uh if it if it is the case but what what exactly is what exactly was generally the the fear and taboo about so, it if, if you can talk about it if, so know. going back going back at the way we see the past going back to the way we see ourselves here in time and space our are different, the way I introduced myself was my clans, Nanisht Ejitkabaha, Zuni Edgewater, born for Ozea Shehe, the Arabi Salt clan, my mother's father is from Tangle people, and Nakadine Deshinale, my grandfather's father is from, my father's, my father's father, my grandfather is from the uh, Mexican people. So when we identify ourselves by clan, we're identifying ourselves to places in space and places in time. Okay. For example, my my Zuni Edgewater clan, when we look back in history, our origin place is at a Pueblo that's east of Santa Fe up in the mountains called Tkapahantlikai, the, the village by the white, white beach, by the white shore. So that relationship is... Me, culturally, I'm Navajo. I speak Navajo, I look Navajo, I think Navajo, but my ancestry goes back to Pueblo people. And to me, that's a way that I can work together. That's a way I can find common ground and a relationship and get things done when it comes to protecting and preserving. And it also allows me, I feel it allows me to be able to interact with places in the landscape, places with sherds with rock art with cliff dwellings all the places i go and interact with things it affords me that faith and that relationship that things don't um, affect me negatively other people think about it differently and for myself that's how okay. that's how i'm able, able to do my job okay. and my my father's clan the salt clan we come from a place that's, um, we come from what's probably Los Salinas Pueblos, um, another Pueblo area that was 
the people left in the late 1850s because of the Americans. But yeah. yeah, all of those come together and make up who I am and establish these relationships with places and people that are out there. And I can feel faith that I'm not going to be affected, that things aren't going to hurt me. Okay. And for, for my people, we don't go into it a lot, but as a matter of respect, when someone's gone, we don't interact with the the things they left with their belongings. We give it away. We get rid of it. And it's part of a psychological letting go. And it's also a psychological, um, it, it prevents us from interacting with something that might have had smallpox on it or tuberculosis. And a lot of our beliefs come from that era of time when disease was rampant and We've seen that 93% of the North American indigenous populations were wiped out before Columbus even stepped foot on the continent. I mean, those early diseases brought by um, Euro-Americans at Linzanzao Meadow in Canada and probably earlier explorers, they probably brought all sorts of diseases. And, and that's just one of the harsh realities we deal with. It's one of the harsh facts is that this continent was depopulated by disease. The lack of our presence has been used as, as an excuse to exclude us. Yeah, unfortunately. So, yeah, and there and there's a lot of uh, on the on the Lansdowne Meadows. That that's very interesting to because of the oral histories, the various um, mm -hmm. Iroquois. And uh, let me interject. I always like to do this. Uh, Yes, to people, members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, I, I'm well aware that Iroquois is not the proper term. Unfortunately, Iroquoian is the only thing we know of for the languages, um, and until a different term is come up with, that's well, we the only way, real way we can identify the language group, so I apologize in advance for... Yeah, and the tribe has been moving forward with renaming themselves with their traditional name, um, I'm not from that area. Hadi Sonani. The the Haudenosaunee. Yeah, Haudenosaunee. Uh, yeah, Haudenosaunee. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I know it. It took me a little bit, a little bit too. Um, but yeah, but yes, unfortunately, the the that's that's the only way we know to identify the language. And to be fair, I'm not saying it's right, but to be fair, Iroquois language group is a lot easier to say than say Haudenosaunee. Yeah, and yeah. we face that here in the Southwest <laughs> too. This, yeah. um, this is going to be all full of tangents here, but yeah. for example, like the Pecos classification, we use a term, they popularize a term in the Anasazi mm. and it's been used so much. It's become, it's gotten away from us. It's become a derogatory term now that people use mm. and people, um, a lot of my Pueblo relatives and colleagues, they don't rightly so they don't like it because we've used yeah. it in the wrong way for so long. In its correct Navajo context, it's Nasaze, which mm. is great, 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 great. Four times, mm. Zaze is your grandparents. Okay. So Nasaze is our great, 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 great four times. Literally, when the first Europeans started talking to Native Americans in the Southwest in the 1600s, 1500s, we were only four generations from what they call prehistory. Yeah. So literally, they point at that cliff dwelling or they point at the mound on a hill probably still standing and navajos would say hey, in the that's our yeah. our great 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 ancestor yeah so that term has mis been misinterpreted it's gotten away from us it's become derogatory and it's something that i think a lot of us here in the southwest that we don't we don't use anymore or we're trying to get away from it out of um respect yeah, of course yeah which is which is why i always li like to to give that you know something like that because i i when i introduce when i talk about the haudenosaunee i'm like the haudenosaunee or more commonly known as the iroquois but more properly known as the haudenosaunee is how i like to phrase it to try and um push <laughs> away yeah. from the term yeah. uh but unfortunately the the language groups is that's the only way you can identify the language groups right now i'm sure yeah. we'll come up with a better way to identify that later but um but you know the the, the iroquois speaking peoples have oral histories of the uh vikings uh the the sorry i don't like to use vikings in that context but uh uh because viking was a specific sort of 
uh, job. Um, but anyways, the Scandinavians who came to Lansdowne Meadows and probably a little bit further south because the Vinland and Greenland sagas mentioned them going a little bit further south. So probably to like, I'd say at most to New York. Um, maybe we don't have archaeological evidence, but it's also very possible based off the oral histories uh, and such. Also, Jack Cartier, uh, the French explorer to Canada, he, he mentions that the, uh, the, the Haudenosaunee and the uh, Hurons and other tribes, talk, they talked about a, um, uh, a lost city uh, called Saguenay that, where they're like, oh, these, these people looked like you, talking to Jack Cartier, uh, and they wore garments similar to yours, and they would trade us in silver and iron and things like that. Uh, and then he was like, oh, okay, you know, and so a lot of people are like, well, maybe that was them talking about Lensau Meadows, but also yeah. to be fair, or it, it could be like El Hombre Dorado, where where it's like the they're just trying to get rid of them. Yeah, exactly. Like the Amazonian tribes yeah. here down. Yeah. In the and... Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like with with Coronado's uh, expeditions, they're like, yeah, they're it's somewhere over there. Leave us alone. <laughs> you know. But um. But okay. So uh. So now to get back on uh to your to your work. So you mentioned you're 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 the archaeologist at uh, Grand Canyon National Park, but you're also the uh fire. Uh, you said you're the fireman. Uh, yeah, so sorts. specifically, my job I deal with cultural resources and fire management. I mm -hmm. deal with. Um, uh, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. I have this okay That's PowerPoint perfect. with some snazzy pictures here that I. That's perfectly fine. Give a talk <laughs> to you. Okay, host disabled screen sharing. Oh, hang on. Let me take care of that. I apologize. <laughs> uh, 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 let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Let me connect. Hmm. Let me get sharing options. I'll participate. There we go. There we go. All right. There you should be able to do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to. Uh, great. How can I start it now? Slideshow. Okay, so can you see that? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, I can't see myself. So my job here is I work with fire management here in the park. And here in the park, we have different types of resources, natural resources, cultural resources. And cultural resources tends to be the most irreplaceable, and it tends to be the most um, uh, susceptible to damage by fire, whether natural or uh, prescribed fire. So part of my job is working to facilitate prescribed fire, fuel reductions, um, fuel treatments around like Grand Canyon Village, around their infrastructure, and also to respond to wildfires to either help suppress them and avoid damaging our cultural resources or helping to turn that fire into a fire, wildland use fire, to use it to mimic natural fire conditions. So my job, I have to keep track of all of their sites here in the park, whether they're susceptible to damage from flame, extended heat duration, from um, dropping water from the air, from bulldozers on the ground. And that's a lot of my day job is working for that, facilitating putting fire on the ground. As a native person, as a scientist, um, I certainly realize that we need fire back into the environment. The exclusion of native people from the environment when we, when the government made these lands in the parks and forests, yeah, keeping us out, they've created these unhealthy jungle-like places, and um, yeah, so now we're more prone to catastrophic fires, that we lose everything. It's so hot, it destroys the soil, it destroys artifacts, it destroys the habitat. But if we were to mimic more natural conditions, which have been here. Uh, prior to fire suppression, fire to what I'm going to call under management rather than and than mismanagement, we can have low intensity, healthy fires. Mm. All of our cultural resource sites out there in the landscape, they've evolved with this low intensity fire. As time goes on and like the recent footprint site in White Sands, we see that the human occupation of North America is actually 23,000 years ago. 20 years ago, when I was in college, they'd say like 
Clovis is it. 12,000 years ago. Don't look beyond that. Don't dig any deeper. Don't ask any questions. Mm -hmm. And then we had the coprolite site in Oregon that showed up. And all of a sudden it was 15,000 years ago. And then we had the, the handprint site down in um, Chile or Tierra del Fuego that was like 30,000 year old handprint. So here in North America, we find the footprint site of White Sands, and all of a sudden we see that humans have been here about 23,000 years. So that's 23,000 years of a managed landscape, of a managed ecosystem that's co-evolved to need humans. These landscapes need humans to bring fire. They need humans to bring plants, good and bad. They need human presence to cause animal migrations to cause animal evolution native people were geneticists we develop corn we develop tomatoes we develop all manner of plants through genetic manipulation and in that same way we we've done these things with the environment so these landscapes they need human beings they need people like us that know how to live there just using it in Navajo, we don't think of management as plans. We don't think of it as option A, B, and B, A, B, and C and big planning meetings and all that. In Navajo, merely existing is part of the plan. So us being there is what nature intended and nature needs us. And we see that everywhere. We look here around the park and we see that our forest in the 1875, you can see the top picture the open tree stands, low tree density, it can handle a giant fire and be fine. But in 2004, my colleague Neil Weintraub, his picture shows it's dense, it's thick, and it's not healthy. The trees aren't as big. They've been clear cut in the past. And any type of fire they're going to get is going to be catastrophic. All that rain or all those trees suck up all the water. You can see there's no water there. So we we've, we've our, the lack of fire, the lack of human presence has caused a lot of our water sources to dry up and it's caused these changes in the landscape. And we see it everywhere. I see it everywhere. In my job, I go from Oregon to New Mexico working on fires. I see different landscapes. I see coastal landscapes, interior landscapes, montane alpine landscapes and see their, how they're being affected by the lack of humans that have been here for 23,000 oh, years. And we see that we we recognize that our fire our forests have evolved with fire and all of those resources the plants and the animals and the cultural resources they need fire to stay healthy and as federal managers and as a native person as a native scientist we deal with elephants in the room and for us archaeologists not necessarily an elephant it's this mastodon big giant snuffle up snuffle up against guy over our shoulder <laughs> and it's looming because the science we practice, the science we use to do our job was developed by non-native people for non-native reasons. A lot of our science is developed to keep, to, to diminish the native uh, voice, to diminish our presence here. And that's just the reality we deal with. We see here at Grand Canyon that we only, we tend to only talk about 2% of time. You go to any park unit in the country and a lot of our information, a lot of the kiosks talk about Teddy Roosevelt. They talk about John yeah. Wesley Powell and the Stanton expedition when that's only 2% of the human occupation. And there's this beautiful, amazing story that's 98% of time here that we're missing out on. And who best to tell it? Native people. We're yeah, here. Of course. We're becoming more educated and more capable of telling the story. And we're out here. And we know as archaeologists that a few flakes we see on the ground, it leads to <laughs> it leads to more. It leads to yeah. sites. Five flakes turns into 20 flakes. And then it turns into 500 flakes. And then we can see the differences in density in tertiary, primary, and secondary. secondary we start yeah. seeing production areas. And we follow those flakes. They're coming downhill. And we look up. Here on Navajo Reservation and, and, and in the Southwest, our hills, we got giant sites like this, thousand room Pueblos, hundred room Pueblos up on a hill. And we think that those few flakes, they can't get bigger than that, but they get much bigger. We zoom out to Google Earth and we see 
like the, this picture in the upper left corner, you see that rectangular alignment. That's yeah. the size of three football fields, eh, two wow. football fields. Okay. And it's well, huge. Either way, yeah. And we get focused on that. We get focused on the cool things, the beautiful things. And sometimes you let yourself get thirsty. You let yourself get tired and you float out into space and it changes your perspective. You see landscape level manipulation. Mm -hmm. You can see that perfect circle that's probably from the 700 to 900 period. And the structure is from the oh. 1000 to 1150 time period. And you okay. see that road system and those roads go to other places on the horizon, other giant pueblos. And we think it can't possibly get bigger than that. Those few flakes, <laughs> they turn into that big site. It turned into this cultural landscape. And then we zoom out even further in the space and we see that one site with that one giant circle is part of a thousand sites, part of a million sites, all equally unique with unique landscape level manipulation with unique architecture. And we see it's this giant civilization. And we see that, oh, it can't get much bigger than that, but how much bigger can it get? We've already gone forward and back in time. We've gone up into space. We're up in Google, the Google satellite. And when it comes around, it comes back to us, Native American people, indigenous people. All those things are little parts of who we are, from the biggest Chaco Pueblo to the, the Cahokia Mounds, to Machu Picchu, to the pottery shirts, to the lithics. All of that is who we are. Sherds, projectile points, to Pueblos, rock art, mountains, all of that is us. When we lose even the smallest bit, we lose a little part of our identity. And as Native people looking forward into the future, we're always looking back to learn something. There's that saying, you don't know where you're going unless you know where we're coming from. So as a scientist, I got to know where my science is coming from. I got to see the eugenics that started at Pecos. I got to see that ugly history and move forward from that. And I have to see my own culture, our belief system on mountains, like the sacred mountain image with the plants that we use as medicine, with the animals that we use for certain things and the different meanings it has. And that helps me in the present as a firefighter, as a fire resource, resource advisor, as a fire archeologist, it helps me make better decisions. And for a lot of us indigenous people, we're not just looking seven generations into the future. We're not looking 70 generations. We're looking 700 generations. Who are we? What are we leaving for the future? How am I setting up the future for success? Those are the reasons that we do science. Those are the reasons we use our traditional ecological knowledge. And those are the reasons why we care and we're taking those risks. We're leaving something for the future. We're leaving management a, a management footing a background for them okay yeah and that's that, that's very very fascinating uh and uh yeah i love i love because I've, I've known this for a while but i love every time the 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 controlled fires and mm -hmm. the controlled burns is brought up because uh actually on my channel i did um uh, a really long uh, an hour and a half I want to say long video about indigenous uh, like uh, indigenous ag uh, agricultural and horticultural techniques mm -hmm. um, both uh, before and after uh, contact up to a certain point I, I didn't really go past the 1800s because it's at that point we, we know what's going on it's, it's sort of uh, I don't want to say irrelevant to you know modern knowledge but it was relevant to, to the video um but it seems to be a uh continent-wide practice because you mentioned Oregon and such but also um a lot of the research papers I looked at uh for for example some were here in the Carolinas and Georgia uh as well as up in the um up in Alaska as well as up in the Great Lakes uh region and the Great Plains uh so it was literally and also in mesoamerica as well so it was literally the entire continent uh and you can see that in the pollen record and the soul record and such such as like the pollen of like uh before 
European colonization of these areas, for example, here in Georgia, you would see more, um, you would see a lot of oak, like live oak and uh, red oak and such, and uh, hi uh, chestnut and hickory pollen, but then like you wouldn't see very much pine or anything yeah. other than that. And same for and same for even up in New York, uh, say in the Great Lakes region or Alaska. Um, but then suddenly after European contact, you start to see these really easily burned trees start to yeah. flourish. And a lot of that came from the lack of cultural fires. Mm -hmm. When we read the book, we look at um, Forgotten Fires by Omar Stewart, and he documents a lot of early colonists sort of complaining that the natives are burning the landscape. And then later they're complaining that the landscapes become unmanageable and impassable. And yeah. we see that removing the original managers ha has led to this catastrophe that we're in. Yeah. I mean, this like yeah. continent wide yeah. ecosystem change that has happened. And yeah. You know, and then like campaigns like Smokey the Bear only yeah. prevent forest fires and things like that and now i there's not a state or a national park or something that i know of that doesn't use controlled burns in some way yeah. to you know control and their <laughs> in our modern times we've learned that it's this useful tool and we've seen great examples and documented examples of how native people use it and that's one way that we work together is like okay we're going to share knowledge and we're going to fix this and we'll we'll fight later but let's um yeah let's let's work on sort of trying to restore this landscape as best we can changes are coming and all we can do is blunt those changes now i think that we've lost our chance to to get climate change and and, and make some positive changes and now we're just going to have to mitigate and react yeah and that's and that's very possible and then uh you know, and uh, uh, high-risk communities, um, like, for example, uh, most of the uh, the Native American reservations, as well as other lower, uh, high-risk communities of people of color are, are the most at risk because, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I by no means grew up wealthy uh i was definitely at most i was lower middle class and that was that's pushing it but you know even with that we're not the ones that are going to suffer the most it's going to be native americans and other people of color and things like that and you were the guys who were already doing the mitigation long before we were here anyway mm -hmm. uh so and that's a very unfortunate to have that happen um you know um the way we make changes, the way we yeah. save things, and preserve things is working together. Yeah. And I think that's pretty important that although Native American communities are being flooded, they're going underwater, they're mm -hmm. getting washed out to sea, that collectively we're all going to have to work together on solutions. Otherwise, we're yeah. all going to lose. And exactly. We and stand together or we don't. And yeah. Which which is you know which is one of the major reasons why uh, made this channel um, was one to provide accurate not whitewashed history uh, though though to be fair I also do do have some European history on there because there are genuinely interesting you know as parts of European history but you know the major reason was well let's look at try to get accurate history especially with you know all the you know, anti uh, all these bills trying to whitewash it, uh, and and so and that's also why I have you know, someone like you on here is like we need you know to spread the word and get you know um, sort of get that out there because not a lot of people you know know uh, for one thing not a lot of people understand archaeology as a whole. I mean, we've all I, I'm I would almost guarantee that you as well. We've all heard the oh you're an archaeologist. So what kind of dinosaurs do you dig up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, or aliens or something like yeah. that. And it's like, and then add that on top of that, that not a lot of people know that there are actual Native American archaeologists like uh, you. And then there's uh, um, an individual named, uh, that you may be aware of because you're in the same region, uh, Curly Tlopioia. Yeah, Curly. So, Apologies if I butchered that name. I'm, I 
uh, and then like John Torres and and things like that, you know. Uh, but a little, but not a lot of people know about that as well. Yeah, so. we're out here and we're all working hard, but unfortunately, we're all focused on like the issues at hand. Yeah, I, of course. I dread the day for Western science when we can all get together. We all have the funding to work on what we need to on the yeah. research that we need to do for native communities on behalf of native people. But like for my, my, myself right now, I'm just reacting, um, mm -hmm. trying to stomp out fires before they get big. I'm trying to prevent damage to resource sites. Mm -hmm. Like behind me, I have one of my screen grabs from the Mangum fire where the fire was blowing up and I was guiding the bulldozers around um, potential lithic scatters and potential arc sites okay. as the fire was happening. So things can get pretty intense in my line of work. And I've been on multiple uh, fires where we've had fatalities, where we've had mm -hmm. um, crews burn over and survive. But in my time, I've seen that all of our fire crews out there, they want to save resources. They want to save the history, the archaeology, and the natural resources that are out there. And I think that that attitude is really what keeps us in business and what, what drives us. Otherwise, we'd all just quit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and in that same regard, um, how much, so, so like, what, when, what type of, like, artifacts you mentioned lithics but like what type of artifacts both culturally and stylistically uh, do you find and how often do you find them uh in context with the burns or um you know like what sites are associated with grand canyon national park other than the ones you've already mentioned and things so, like that so really quick looking at the way we the way we deal with fires we <laughs> we often plan for it and we can go out before a fire, before a prescribed fire or fuel treatment, and we can survey some areas. We can select areas of high probability. We can select areas where we know that there might be something and we can go in, survey those areas, record it and work to avoid damage. Mm -hmm. We can avoid damage by doing a fuel reduction so it doesn't burn as hot. And that's what we like to do. We can still burn the site which goes along with our native beliefs that natural mm -hmm. events need to happen, but we keep it from burning so hot, it destroys it. So that's part of my job too, is coming up with those types of plans. Okay. And during an active fire, let's say a big wildfire, like uh, Cedar Creek in Oregon or the car fire in Colorado, mm -hmm. one of those big fires, um, we can get out with the crews and get ahead of them where they're digging lines, where they're prepping roads and, we can do that same survey fast, or we can look at our survey data and see what's out there and how we can avoid it. And we can be embedded with the crews and work with them on the ground to avoid damaging things and educating them at the same time. Okay. And we can also work with fire planners. Hey, there's a big site here. The best thing we can do is just let it burn. So the managers will say, okay, yeah, we'll just use this road. It makes better sense. Or we'll use this next ridge, ridge line. So we're helping make decisions to suppress or manage the fire without, without risk to firefighters on the ground, without risk to communities too, and without risk of those irreplaceable resources. Mm -hmm. And after a fire, we can go in and we can work with suppression repair. Mm -hmm. Landscapes are burned, we get flooding effects, creeks overflow, we get landslides, and we can work with crews on the ground, post-fire personnel, to avoid damaging those arc sites because they're going to have to bring in another bulldozer to fix the bulldozer damage from the initial attack. We're trying to get around it. And let's say we lost it and there's just miles and miles of dozer line. We survey those lines, we identify things and we avoid damage or we mitigate damage by documentation or testing. Okay. So pretty, pretty intense. And, and that's where I, that's where I thrive in that kind, that kind of work. <laughs> okay. So going here to Grand Canyon specifically, here at Grand Canyon, we have 11 tribes with 11 distinct cultures mm -hmm. and 11 dis distinct identities. And I don't want to speak for all of them. Of and even speaking for my tribe, the the, the ne we have different groups, we have different clans with different belief systems. But here at Grand Canyon, we have a lot of lithic scatters. We have uh, a few paleo sites represented by 
a Clovis point, a Folsom point. One of them I found on the Wildcat fire about 10 years ago. And we also have a Folsom point from the North Rim of the Canyon. We have a very big archaic representation, the different Pinto Bajada points associated with the 600 to 3000 AD time period. Oh, okay. Very interesting. Um, pre, a great preformative period of early um, agricultural people represented mostly by the early preformative pottery types. We have extensive Pueblo occupation on the north and the south rim. And even into the proto-historic period with uh, early Numic people, Paiute people, um, modern Hopi, Zuni people coming back, and Navajo people, Apache people coming into the areas. So all of our different cultures that pass through here have left the mark, identifiable in our physical uh, artifact assemblages that are out there. Okay. And we took with us those marks. We sing about the canyon in ceremonies we draw it in sand paintings we talk about it it's people know about it even though they haven't been here because they've heard it in songs and prayers when they were growing up so okay okay uh, one second let me pause this. <laughs> <laughs> anyways okay well and that's very interesting uh to hear about uh all the different things um uh so, so you mentioned that very large archaic site. Uh, what, what can you tell me about uh, it uh, specifically that you know of? Uh, so, I mean, just like the Great Basin with its extensive archaic lithic scatters, uh, mm -hmm. the Grand Canyon could sort of be thought of as part of that early hunting culture okay. that eventually evolved into um, the preformative cultures. And most of it's lithic with... Mm -hmm. Uh, one-handed biscuit monos, um, the different lithic projectile types, the different lithic materials from different areas. And, mm -hmm. and this is just part of this big landscape that people were moving across, hunting what was probably um, specifically bighorn sheep and um, deer ungulates. Okay. All right. Uh, and... Um... You mentioned the preformative period. Uh, honestly, you know my my experience is mainly in the American Southeast, so we have slightly different time period names. I mean, archaic is the same, and Paleo Indian is is the same. But then we but we have you know things like uh, the Woodland period and the Mississippi period, uh, and the Woodland period is divided into subcategories: uh, early, middle, and late. Uh, so so I. Uh, how, how is the preformative period defined and generally like what made up the preformative period like culturally and like yeah and, so uh, around here in the Pecos classification mm -hmm. it sort of used to be called the basket maker period so mm -hmm. those are early people that were starting to practice agriculture but were still doing a lot of hunting and gathering so they had a lot of um, basket materials and were very reliant on hunting and uh, what foods they could gather. But at the same time, agriculture was starting to show up and we start to see the beginnings of agricultural plots in places like um, Black Mesa, which is about mm -hmm. 60, 60 miles east of here. We have an early agricultural site up there and the ones coming from Southern Arizona, Northern Old Mexico were coming up. So we're seeing the culture evolve away from hunting to hunting and gathering, and then to early, early agriculture. And we see that with like um, our different agricultural complexes, agro, agricultural complex sites we have. We have extensive terrace gardens, uh, extensive grid gardens here on the north and the south rim, and into the Pueblo period, which would be the um, what they used to call the Anasazi period, it would have been extensive fields, corn fields, uh, check dams, uh, more very big terrace complexes and associated storage structures like giant multi-room room blocks, multi-story, multi-room pueblos that start showing up in a landscape. Okay. And and I know there was extensive trade with, uh, say, uh, Mexico and uh, Mesoamerica and also 
I believe, I don't know if the uh, Hopewell Trade Network's reached that far, and they reached as far as Colorado, but I would assume, presumably, with the Mississippi and Hopewell cultures as well, uh, so that I know of. Yeah, so a lot of the trade would have obviously been secondary. Chaco had yeah. probably the more direct trade route mm-hmm. with our southern neighbors, but here at the Canyon, we have some of our sites that have um, uh, agave 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 gardens that Mm. have been there for a thousand years and that type of agave comes from northern mexico so we have indications of travel back and forth the colorado river runs right through the canyon rivers are convenient travel and economic corridors since the beginning of time yeah of, of course i mean basically literally every civilization in the world (laughs) it's generally pops up around rivers whether it be the mississippi uh the colorado the uh, the young sun china the nile and egypt you know etc yeah one of the things we have to think about when we we ask questions like that and i ask them all the time i'm western science educated but i'm also consider myself a traditional is that we ask what's what's distinguishable like what's the diagnostic grand canyon site what's the typical grand canyon this and that but grand canyon is much bigger than just this canyon it it extends far beyond here um years ago i before i got my job here i worked with a group of activists that were fighting um inappropriate development on the edge of the canyon on navajo reservation these developers wanted to build a tram at the confluence of the Grand Canyon and the Little Colorado River, which is one of the most sacred places to the Navajos and, and some of our Pueblo relatives. So we were fighting that and the developers were saying, it's just a place, it's just a place, it's just a place. But as traditional people, we're like, no, these things are bigger than that. We see the Grand Canyon is part of the salt trail. The salt trail goes from Grand Canyon to Tuba City, Tuba City to Hopi all the way out to Antelope Mesa. And then it goes down toward the Arizona and the Mexico border. And it goes to Zuni and it goes south of Zuni, the Zuni Salt Lake. And it goes even further south to old Mexico. So we think of Grand Canyon as just this place and it is a place, but it's connected to all these other places. So as a native person, when I think of Grand Canyon, I'm thinking of Chaco. I'm thinking mm-hmm. of Zuni, I'm thinking of Hopi, I'm thinking of the salt they found in Southern Utah in canyon lands that came from the Little Colorado River. Someone carried salt, like something like 300 miles in some <laughs> Hopi yellowware pots out there. Those are the connections. So when someone says Grand Canyon, I don't just think of this big hole in the ground. Of course. Just yeah. This big, amazing place. And Yeah. I, I didn't mean that to as a negative. I just like, Oh, no, no, of course, of course. Well, and, and that's and I think that's how things should be looked at uh, in, in all forms of archaeology, because, you know, like, you, you know, there's, uh, of course, as we both know as archaeologists, that for much of the history of archaeology, it was very, 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 very many times more uh, mm-hmm. Eurocentric. Uh, and so, like, the, it, and of course, a little bit in Egypt and Mesopotamia, but then everything else is like, ah, they weren't civilizations, but it's like that that's how it works. Like uh, here in Georgia, you know, we have um, the Hopewell, the Hopewell interaction sphere in, the, in all the southeast, and that's divided into several different subgroups. And here in Georgia, there's the Swift Creek culture, which if you look at the map, it go, covers basically all of Georgia. And it's like how, you know how do you quantify that and then also a little further um you have the mississippian sites and yeah. he, he, I, here in georgia one of the most famous mississippian sites are oak mogi and etowah and you know everyone thinks of etowah just as the city it is now but really it was part of the big southern appalachian mississippian yeah. uh culture and then later on it was part of this massive uh chiefdom um uh, which i <sighs> I've I've been one I've been arguing lately that we should maybe start just referring to chieftains as nations because that's essentially what that's they were you know so that's been one of the problems with American yeah. archaeology since its beginning yeah. is 
referring to Native nations as tribal groups, as, as yeah. societies, not the civilizations they were. Yeah, exactly. To build those mounds, you needed people in charge. You needed yeah, scientists. Exactly. You needed geologists. You needed a self-governing society. And that's what Chaco was. That's what Mesa Verde. That's what yeah. Cahokia. That's what the... The, the 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 Iroquois Confederacy I can't pronounce their name yeah um, that's okay yeah 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 and all of those cultures Machu Picchu all of that was people yeah. with, and probably an elected leadership with representative leadership of some type with yeah. leaders with scientists with engineers and yeah we don't call them civilizations we don't call them nations because early Americans like it made it easier for them to legitimize like we're going to take this we're going to take over yeah. this place and kill everyone because these people are ignorant savages and yeah, they're not even right. from here anyways like they're no, from, no. They're from well, Egypt well, and, and we're back at that now we're saying yeah. they're not even from here they're aliens they couldn't have possibly built this they're so stupid they yeah or or it's Atlantis an or artist Atlantis, or engineer. Yeah. and that's just this crazy conversation that we're that society is in that people propagate that people push and it's just this long line of trying to delegitimize native occupation, delegitimize mm -hmm. native existence. Yeah. That I'm not descended from smart people, that I'm descended from people that couldn't have made a string and pulled a long straight line, <laughs> pulled it in a half circle to build a giant D-shaped Pueblo. Like it, it's people do yeah. it for smart time yeah. and energy and mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and like you, you know, continue on the the Mississippian thing. Like by the time that DeSoto uh, and the Spanish began exploring the southeast of Mississippians, you know, there were uh, there were these chiefdom, these chiefdoms, kingdoms, nations is what I prefer to call them. But still, they they were that they described were there that they had probably always been there. And the one specific was specifically here in. Uh, Georgia was the Kusa chiefdom, and if you look at the map, it it covers much most of northeast Georgia, a good chunk of northeast Alabama, uh, most of northeast T Tennessee, and most of north uh, most of west South Carolina and North Carolina. I'm like, that's as big as a European nation at well, both at the time and now. I'm like, and it, and they had multiple cities and things, and like. DeSoto even described one of the cities where, like, he, it was after he, he, like, a lot of Spanish, you know, kidnapped the uh, the chief, uh, the the sachem, what what um whatever was their designation, because uh, of course it varies from uh, people to people. Uh, and he gets to this fortress that he calls uh, Ulitaba, and he's describing it. He's like, there were a whole; these walls were big and. Uh, as thick as two men together and they were as tall as two pikes and there were and it was filled with like uh 2000 warriors or something like that he had like maybe 200 men with him and and then it, and then right after that it goes it says uh and then he called the chief here to and the chief told the warriors to stand down which told and uh i mm -hmm. i take as he he held the guy at gunpoint and was like tell your warriors not to kill us but that yeah, this and, description is like that's a major that's a city that's that's a, yeah. a fortress and, and cabeza de vaca, when he wrote yeah. his the yeah. story of alvar nunez cabeza de vaca in 1528 he talks about those civilizations in texas and civilizations in the southwest and later when he went back with the coronado expedition like they were like El Muerto, they were dead, cities of the dead. And a lot of those populations had been wiped out by yeah. those diseases brought by Ponce de Leon and mm -hmm. Hernando Cortez. And, uh, and yeah, and the Soto, Soto, Soto and, expedition. Uh, uh, and uh, de Luna, Tristan de Luna and uh, Juan Pardo, uh, a whole lot of them <laughs> you know, who came through. Yeah. Um, and, and, and one of my other favorite facts to talk about to sort of dispel the myth of um uh, Europeans being uh more advanced or more civilized than Native Americans is e even in DeSoto's own journals he's talking about how the uh the longbows used by the southeastern tribes as well as the is the atlals because atlals were still being used then as uh -oh. well uh, atlal, um, uh, uh -oh. apologies yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah uh 
but uh, they were both being used and he's describing how he's like they're they're more accurate then they're that both are more accurate than the yeah. muskets uh and their crossbows because the spanish also brought crossbows they could fire they had a better firing rate uh and they could penetrate the spanish yeah. arm. Our, our contributions the native contribution is what made america america i mean yeah we taught the colonists what plants to plant we taught yeah. them what animals to hunt we taught them how to fight yeah, the Americans could never have beat the British if they didn't fight like Indians behind trees wearing buckskins yeah. that blended in. They wouldn't know agriculture. They wouldn't know all those things. Like a lot of the early medicine, early plants, all of that technology was learned from native people. Mm -hmm. And then they turn around and then say we're the we're the savages. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like in in like going on the they they taught them how to fight. Tristan uh, both De Soto and Tristan De Luna mentioned how the southeastern tribes uh with their war clubs their exact words were like they were just as skilled in their in their use of war club of their war clubs as european sword masters were with their swords mm -hmm. which is you know means they were very skilled with their weapons and they talk about how they did you know elaborate uh dances and and um the training methods that they would use and things like that and of course the the various battles they had and it's like yeah they were very skilled in fact there was an excerpt in that where like they had captured some mississippian warriors and during the night the mississippian warriors escaped pick up they picked up uh the spanish swords and were able to use them immediately they're like oh this is just a a, sh a slightly harder sharper version of my war club stab you know <laughs> it's like so it's just like they knew what the stuff was if they just because they didn't necessarily always use it didn't mean they knew it didn't know how to you know make it or use it i mean after all copper and bronze were used in uh north america for thousands of years so uh <laughs> so yeah um which i so i i 100 agree you know um uh and such uh what I was gonna say. Oh yes. Uh, so you mentioned the salt trail. So explain that a little bit because I've actually not heard of that much. Uh, so here in the here in the Southwest in in our cultures, we have a whole series of routes and trails that have been used thousands of years, probably twenty three thousand mm -hmm. years. That were old migration routes that are old trade routes, and mm -hmm. they become a part of our songs and ceremonies and ritual mm -hmm. travels and and that's just one of the mini trails that we have and, okay okay and i presume based off of its name it was primarily used to go and obtain salt uh uh yeah, it goes to a different many 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 different salt sources and okay. not just all right that 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 makes sense and, and that's very interesting because like i said I, i've um, being that most of my work is in the American Southeast, I have I don't know that much about the American Southwest, so I've yeah, never heard about that trail. Salt, just like, just like in the Mediterranean and yeah. old Africa, it's like very important resource. And yeah, there's whole pueblo cities like Las Salinas, Las Comanas, Cuevera, Abo that were established around the giant salt lake and exporting salt for curing bison hides and engaging in trade from the plains so okay. very very big economic driver out here okay and that and that's that makes a lot of sense because as you said salt is uh very important and uh for mo a good chunk of the world if not most of the world mm -hmm. um and, and especially and when it comes to trade so yeah that that's that like I said, very interesting i had not heard of that uh uh, I'm very pleased to have learned about that. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, you know, going back uh, to your work with uh, Grand Canyon National Park. Um, so judging from your PowerPoint, uh, you do uh, present about the stuff. Um, how do you engage with the general public, uh, um, indigenous or otherwise, uh, about your work with uh, Grand Canyon National Park is as well as uh, archaeology and things like that. So I I think of my job as an archaeologist as a scientist is mm -hmm. I'm this educator I'm this interpreter I'm looking at data from a hundred years ago a thousand years ago mm -hmm. ten thousand years ago 
I'm looking at numbers. I'm looking at stratigraphy. I'm looking at styles of, of art, styles of projectile points. I'm looking at designs on pottery and I'm interpreting that. I'm interpreting it just like I could read something in English and put it into Navajo. Okay. That's what I'm doing is I'm taking this voice from the past and I'm translating it to the future. So that's what we do as scientists. That's what we do as archaeologists is we're reading, we're listening, we're looking, and we're translating it. Not just the data that's there, but those meanings. Because those meanings are important for cultural identity. They're important for cultural survival. And that's why we interpret these things. We can be fascinated all day on this amazing rock art that's out there. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if we don't apply it to save something, if we don't apply it to preserve something, we're just out there looking at cool things. We're just sightseers. We're just tourists. But when we learn from it, when we apply from it, when we use that information to make decisions for the future, that's what gives it its power. That's what gives it its strength. That's why we do what we do. I think a lot of archaeologists, they don't realize that that's what they do. And if you haven't, I'm telling you now, that's oh, what oh, you're doing yeah. is you're saving something for the future. You're protecting yeah. and preserving just like any old ranger with a gun, just like anyone with a PhD. Uh -huh. We're taking that, that data and we're putting it to good. That's what gives it life. That's what gives it energy. Dead things are poisonous. Dead things hurt you. If you think of the past as dead, if you think of archaeology as dead, you're going to get sick. It's going to get to you spiritually and mentally. But when you think of it as alive, as something that has a life in Navajo, it's this, uh, this, this breath of life, yeah. then it has the ability to empower you, the ability to strengthen you and give you, I guess, faith is the word that what you're doing is right and what you're doing is just. Okay. All right. Uh, and um, do, do people, uh, do, do uh, people come often to Grand Canyon National Park, like for, say, f uh, field trips and such, and do you engage with uh, the, uh, the youth, younger generation, you know, school age groups and such? Or... So we have, uh, all park units have different um, divisions, uh, interpretation, Fire and aviation, science and resource management, and I just happen to work for science and resource management and fire and aviation. But okay. there's people whose jobs it is is to interpret these things, to, to talk to the public about it. And the way they do it is the information that's available. And okay. as a scientist, I'm working toward giving them the best available okay. information about my people, my culture, and the past, and the things we can learn from it. And they're the ones that that, that send that information out. So I have incentive to work with them, to educate them, to give them the best tools they can have. Okay. And that makes a lot of sense. So of course. And, you want... Yeah. And occasionally yeah. someone will come and like, Hey, we want to talk to, we want to talk to an archeologist and I'm <laughs> available for those types of things because I'm a, I'm a believer. I'm an idealist. So. Yeah. And that, yeah. And I, and I think that's good. And I think, uh, de public outreach is very important, um, especially because because you know, something that I personally have run into in the past couple of weeks, uh, two or three weeks actually, you know, a lot of people, uh, both either sometimes both sometimes separately either don't know or don't care about laws like say the Antiquities Act or mm -hmm. ARPA or NAGPRA and, and things like that. Uh, and so public outreach is a good way to, you know, combat both uh, ignorance and misinformation about archaeology yeah. and, and, and things like that. As scientists, to me, as a native scientist, anything I've learned, anything I've picked up over time, mm -hmm. I've learned from native lands. I've learned from native people. And it's my obligation to give that back to them. Yeah. And they're the public. And the public are the ones that vote on funding. The public are the ones that vote on the politicians that make our laws, like mm -hmm. Archaeological Resource Protection Act, American Indian Religious Freedoms Act, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So yeah. we have incentive to keep them as educated as we can and give them the best available information. 
Otherwise, they're out there saying, I'm not going to vote for native rights because they're all from Egypt. They don't need it. Or they're all worshiping golden Buddhas in the Grand Canyon or <laughs> some pyramid down there, some sort of BS like that. Or oh, yeah. There's that danger in letting those types of stories go. Just blatant yeah. falsehoods, blatant attempts to erase the natives from yeah. history. So when we work with the public, we prevent that. We make the public better and we make ourselves stronger like we are. We should be. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Because otherwise, like you said, we have people like, uh, say, Randall Carlson or Graham Hancock spouting things like, say, oh, there's a temple of ISIS in <laughs> the Grand Canyon. You, Hang you know, on, my, my light just went off. Give me one second. That's uh, okay. Yeah. I got to yeah. run down the hall to turn it on. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, as you're saying, yeah, yeah. So we're all working to protect and preserve culture, but we're also working against mismanagement and mismanagement yeah. with potential potential to to do very adverse things for native people, mm -hmm. people that don't believe in indigenous intelligence, that don't believe in indigenous beauty, are more likely to vote against us when it comes to laws and policies in this country. Yeah, and that's. Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of that is, um, it's always been there, but unfortunately, a lot of that is on the rise uh, a lot lately, especially. Yeah, no. History attempts. Channel. Yeah, uh, yeah. Netflix, they're all part of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and then and attempts by politicians to whitewash history, you know, mm -hmm. American history, um, you know, or uh as i've dealt with also in the last couple of weeks a lot of people trying to claim that say american history is like say only 150 or 200 years old when it's like i and a lot of history yeah you know, a lot of archaeologists and a lot of historians uh, myself included have been like well no it's actually you know i mean you mentioned yeah. um white sands uh with, with the foot feet for, uh, footprints uh but also like just the year after that there was another paper that came out talking about a site and i want to say montana i'd have to look at the paper again yeah i, I forget exactly where that they, they said was around between thirty-seven thousand to forty thousand uh years old based off the archaeological evidence which make makes sense to me i i, I feel like fifty thousand years might be uh not mm, out of the yeah. question but uh for me as a native person and as a federal scientist, we deal with like the information at hand, the things yeah. we can see, the things we can prove, thermal luminescent dating, C14 yeah. dating, all of the best available sciences. And I also have the things that I believe, my culture, the things I was taught by my grandparents and science, it proves both. Yeah, there's our whole Bering Strait theory. There's our whole pre-Clovis theory, and mm -hmm. all of that's talked about in Navajo culture. Our interactions with monsters in the past, which would have been like cave lions, which could have been um, ground sloths and and creatures like that. Like we, everyone's like, oh, humans never interacted with them, and then this footprint site with the sloth print right yeah. next to the human print is like, oh wow, we did, and yeah. it's like told you so and yeah exactly i think it's always going to be like that but for me it's like it proves that native people have been here time immemorial is time immemorial yeah without humans here there's no concept of time there's no there's no mm -hmm. beauty there's no life without us here to see these things to appreciate these things and that's one of the things that as navajo as the native people that we we we're always considering is like, yeah, there's this Western version. It's also right, but our version's also right. Yeah. And science is more than welcome. It's barely catching up. And we're yeah. just gonna sort of chuckle and like, yeah, told you so. And yeah. Well and and yeah, and I'm a I'm a big believer in oral and and listening to oral history. Uh and a lot of times when I've brought that up, but now a lot of archaeologists do actually consider oral oral history history, mm -hmm. but a lot of times I've brought up to people like say outside of archaeology and they pull out the old 
uh, telephone argument. Oh, you know, the, the you know the big fish argument. Oh, it starts off this big and suddenly it's yeah. the size of the Empire State Building. It's like, okay, I mean, but that's not how that works in any oral history, any culture that uses oral history yeah, across and, the world at all. That's one uh, of the great things about science is when we get new information, we sure. we change. We, we learn yeah. from it. We adjust from it. Now we're seeing that this Bering Strait theory is not entirely possible, but we're seeing a more plausible, the kelp highway along the coast, people yeah. in canoes and kayaks. And that's part of Navajo history, this water world that we came down, interacting with sea mammals, interacting with other sea people out on the coast. And that's part of our culture. So we know that we travel down. And yeah. And that, that, and that's uh, very, that, and that in itself is very fascinating. Uh, to hear about because you know i because again i don't know much about uh navajo um uh i don't want to say mythology because that's uh it not always a correct term but you know navajo cultural histories and oral histories and so, stories you know so just repeat after me the nepahane the hepahane the nepahane that's the things we say the things we believe okay. the way things are and that's part of it. Yeah. The th events of yesterday are just as important and powerful as the events of 23,000 years ago. Okay. Yeah, and that and that makes sense. And also, apologies if I butchered the phrase. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> Dude, I'm like trying to speak other tribes like i'm lost I'm... oh yeah yeah so but so so i i'm i i'm really trying and I, and I apologize if i butcher it i'm not uh attempting to do that uh but yeah but that's uh yeah that, and that's very interesting and uh like i said i was not aware that y that y'all had stories like that about coming mm -hmm. uh you know down uh a, a kelp highway-esque story uh which but that would make sense considering Again, the archaeological evidence, White Sands and the the site in uh, uh, Montana. Uh, I'm just going to uh, say Montana for now until I look at it later and like, oh, it's actually the state next door. Yeah, but, you know, one thing to consider too that I, I mentioned that we all have different beliefs, even within our <laughs> same tribe. Like Navajo <laughs> people, we're coming from all these different directions. Some are coming up from South America. Some are coming from the east. Some are coming out of the the northern the canadian canada athabascan yeah. peoples are coming down the kelp highway and navajo yeah. the ne which is the word for navajo mm -hmm. it doesn't mean athabascan speaker it doesn't mean athabascan person it means the people yeah so when you say the ne you're talking about all the people that make up our tribe and they come from zuni they come from hopi they come from lakotas and comanches and mexicans and we're the people, literally, people with different origins, with different backgrounds, with different beliefs that have come together, and now we're part of this tribe. We didn't used to be an exclusive culture. And so then, we probably yeah. have descendants from Cahokia. We have descendants from Teotihuacan and uh, Pakime. And that, make, that makes a lot of sense, because again, you know, like, thanks to people like Jared Diamond, uh, and gun germs and steel, you know, a lot of people think, well, that that ridiculous idea that somehow movement and trade is easier horizontally on a continent rather uh, than vertically, which is not how that works. You know, thanks to th thanks to things like that, people don't under don't realize that people in North America and South America did get around and mm -hmm. migrated and intermarried with each other and things like that so i mean when you're describing it that makes a lot of sense because needs more, needs yeah. more research because obviously yeah. seafaring people like in the aztec area they had canoes and boats capable of crossing the yeah. gulf of texas and yeah exactly yeah and that and that's exactly it you know and so so that would that makes a, a lot of sense that you would have multiple origin points for uh the Dene um and the various uh cultural groups that came eventually came to the southwest uh and such so um see here uh what we're you know, so while we're talking about you mentioned you know uh, 
what you worked before you started your current job. So, so how did you get uh, started? Like, how, how did you get involved with uh, Grand Canyon National Park uh, as so, a career? Going back to the beginning, I was in college and I became a seasonal park ranger at Navajo National Monument. And my time there at Kitsu sort of taught me these relationships. Mm -hmm. And as I was graduating, I heard about this excavation on Black Mesa, the um, some salvage projects for a road in the Navajo Nation at that time, we had this excellent archaeology program, a training program, and with great experienced archaeologists and students. And mm -hmm. I was graduating and it's like, yeah, you know what, I think I'm a I don't know what I've seen on TV, go run some screens and stuff. And so I went up and volunteered and got hired as a laborer. And my, my mentors at, at the Navajo archeology span department saw something in me and believed in me and sort of kept me working, kept me busy. And as my season continued into winter, they brought me into the lab and I process artifacts and started helping out with the documentation and report writing. And they're like, dude, you got the science background. You have this degree in environmental science. You have learned all of this history and cultural, your own cultural history and what you were teaching at Navajo National Monument as a ranger. It was like, you can come work here. And eventually I got hired at the Navajo Archaeology Department and we didn't do strictly excavation. We did a lot of projects to facilitate modernizing, continuing the modernization of the Navajo Reservation through infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So hospitals, roads, power lines, sewage for sanitation. I did a lot of those field surveys and ethnographic interviews in support of that. Interviewing elders in Navajo and English and working to provide them handicap access ramps, um, sewage ponds, water lines, all of that. And that was my dream job, helping out my people on our land, being able to live on my reservation, doing to me the creator's work. And unfortunately, budget problems and all that and my department um, ended. But by the time I left the Navajo archeology span department, I was, I say field director, I was managing field projects, but not mm. necessarily the title of a director. Yeah, not not necessarily yeah. a an official field director. Yeah, but by that time I had been running, help managing projects, uh, writing budgets. Um, I had been crew chiefing for years. And by the time I left the Navajo Archaeology Department, I was, I was up there <laughs> pretty, <laughs> pretty good at what I do and I had to take a massive step back and become like the seasonal GS5 archaeologist with the park mm -hmm. well I, I worked at the museum in the interim when I left NAD and started working for the park mm -hmm. and the the same great mentors the same great people that believed in me and encouraged me to keep going and provided me access to analyze artifacts at the museum provided me the ability to help out on field survey projects and all that. And I started out here in the park as a seasonal archeologist. And because of my my previous training as a, as a firefighter, they're like, hey, can you go out on these fires and work with these guys on those cultural resource issues? And I did that and that became my passion. It became my calling in life. And I had gone out on multiple fire assignments over the past 12 years now, giant fires uh, I was in the car fire, of whiskey town. And I was in Cedar Creek in Oregon, all these like little lightning strikes. And so I've been a lot of places and I fill this role as a resource advisor, advising on general resource issues. I can work with fish habitat, bird habitat, uh, air quality, wilderness wreck and all that. But my specific job is dealing with cultural resources a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'll work with fire management teams on like, tribal concerns sometimes, um, being this go-between between, between science departments and fire managers and all that. And that's what I do across the West these days. And now I do a lot of training, training other resource advisors. So I help train mm -hmm. scientists 
to be on fire lines and I help train firefighters to, to, to deal with the science work we do. So that's become my main job and, okay. and it's led to where I'm at today. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and like I said, all, all, all of that is incredibly fascinating and, um, it, and it's always, always interesting to hear the, the different paths that various archeologists take, you know, some going into environmental science, uh, some going into say, uh, being ceramicists, I'm going into archaeology law, you know, th yeah, yeah things I, like that. I tell people, all archaeologists, we have a malfunction, and mine is ceramics. Oh, I used to love making pottery, and I make black and white pottery, and <laughs> yellowware pottery, and Navajo pottery, but I got that old age, my arthritis, and all those old battle scars start yeah. numb parts of my hand now. And... Yeah. Yeah, uh, I I feel you uh, feel you, feel you on the uh, pottery is my uh, is my uh, to still a currently term is is my kryptonite because I part of my part of, part of what I'm trying to go into graduate school for is uh, is lithics and being a a, a lithicist because uh, I just find lithics fascinating. But one of my mentors. Uh, who I'm, who I'm still currently working with, he's a ceramicist. And so he's, he's, you know, talking about ceramics. And I'm like, I, I'll like, I'll trust you on that sort of like, it's like, I'll, I'll defer to your specialty, my dear sir. I'm not sure on that. I mean, I find uh, pottery across the world, ceramics across the world, beautiful, but I, I can't tell you which one is like, say transitional period, a to C and or D, uh, but I can tell you, you know, a lot about lithics and, and things like that. So I definitely understand ceramics as being a uh, is a weak point. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, so one last thing I, I I always like to ask archaeologists uh, before we go uh, before we end things is. Um, you know, and, and and this is a special appointment because you you want to pass the information on to the next generation of, say, the Diné and other uh, indigenous people. So, what would you know? What would be your uh, suggestion to the next generation about, like, it, it, how would you try to convince them to become archaeologists? Because archaeology is actually a growing field, as a recent paper talked about. You know, so how would you? You, you know, what would be your advice to the next aspiring, uh, next generation of aspiring archaeologists, uh, both indigenous and non-indigenous? So anyone can speak, anyone can ramble, but it okay. takes people to listen. Scientists in general need to develop communication skills to be able to talk about what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. Otherwise, we're just tourists we're just collectors we're just oh. looking for cool things and that's not what this science is about we we have to stop disassociating people with science with artifacts all the things we find have been held they've been made they've been thought about there's been thought processes science and medicine behind all of these things and when we learn these things we have the special ability to see it we have the special ability to hear people across thousands of years. And we have this even better ability, the sacred ability to speak it, to communicate it and share it. If we don't do that, we lose. We're not a scientist anymore. We're just, hmm. we're just visitors. We're just tourists. And so that's one thing I, I really think that we need to emphasize more is communication skills for scientists. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's very important in uh, learning how to um, look at not only look at information but process the information and interpret the information. That that's that's the word I was looking for. Interpret the information, uh, look at and interpret the information so that you can adequately communicate as well. Yeah, uh, and someday, hopefully, the world will get to this point where we don't have to be constantly reacting and mitigating. And I think that people like me, people like our other indigenous scientists out there will be able to get ahead and start doing our own research and start doing our own traditional ecological science rather than just having to try to put out fires to keep things from getting damaged. And 
Yeah, exactly. Or try to keep things from getting looted or mm -hmm. anything like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for coming on, um, and such, uh, very fascinating to listen to uh, y y your work uh, and your history in archaeology, uh, the the history of the archaeology and cultural history of the region itself, because, again, I and many people are uh, unaware of uh, the history. I mean, I'm aware of, like, say, the Hohokam and the Magayon um, uh, cultures, but that's generally, you know, you know, that, and then, of course, the the Diné and the Apache and the, the Zuni and such who had contact with the U.S. after uh, Columbus and such. I, I know about that, but the, before then, I'm not very versed. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very fascinating to learn about that. Uh, and of course, it, 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 the, it's of course very fascinating to hear uh, the indigenous perspective on archaeology as a whole, which is one of the reasons I contacted you, and of course I was very forthright with that, uh, and so it's it's very good to have that indigenous perspective on archaeology, which is often missing from <laughs> most archaeological media uh, outside of academia. Uh, so, so again, thank you very much for coming and sharing your story and your perspectives and and your work. So. Yeah, thanks for having me. And if you have any further questions, I am always willing to help out in some way or of course, yeah. Send people in the send people in the right direction and and yeah. um Yeah, so I guess have a good night everybody. Yeah.